morning, everybody. My name is Janet LeBeau. I am a law clerk at Gluckstein's, and I am here with my friends and colleagues, Jan Marin and Jessica Glosky, who are both lawyers at Gluckstein's, and Brenda Agnew, who is our marketing manager and also a former client. Um, this, this particular uh, webinar is about our After the Settlement Best Practices and Lessons Learned. We're going to have a panel discussion about this and then open it up for some discussion. This particular guide is something that we have felt is very important to create. Um, my background as a law clerk is that I primarily, um, before I was at Gluckstein's, worked for several lawyers throughout the province, uh, specializing in medical negligence cases, particularly birth trauma cases. And I recognized in my career that there was a significant need for this type of guide. Um, many um, clients, once we've um, gone through the whole process and we get to resolution, there is basically, here you go on, you know, and we send people on their merry way with their um, um settlement, their structure, they've got all the resources available to them to be able to take care of their um, uh, child or or minor or or whoever that is that they are they're being the guardian for. I apologize for the confusion here. And um, and then two years later, I would often get a call from my client um, and say, where they are going through what's called the passing of accounts. We will explain that later on. And they're completely blindsided. Um, Brenda, when she was a client, uh, you know, we we created a, a settlement for her. She and and her family were very happy with this settlement. And then in 2019, about around this time of year, I got a call from Brenda at 10 in the evening crying her eyes out saying, what is going on? And so she had no idea how to navigate through this. She didn't have the um, tools or a guide or any kind of um, background information on what she needed in order to be able to get through this passing of accounts. So with that, um, we decided, Around that time, Brenda and I had a conversation about this might be something that we could take on as a firm. And then of course, Jan and Jessica were very keen on being part of it and have um, been very instrumental in creating this guide. And so here we go. So Jan, um, I, what do you believe are the essential things guardians must be told when they agree to take on the role of guardian of property? I think first and foremost, there needs to be a really important discussion about not just the client's willingness to do it, but their understanding that this is a very formal regimented process. That's not as simple as you're going to have control over these finances with some court oversight. It is a time intensive um, and fiduciary responsibility. And not all of our clients are sophisticated. So we need to explain these concepts to them. What does it mean to be a fiduciary? What does it mean to essentially put the needs of someone before your own as parents of course that's part of the gig for most people but it's very different when there's oversight and someone who's going to be looking at everything you've done you don't have the right to make judgment calls you need to know that this is formal i think that our guardians need to understand that there's a process and we're going to talk in detail about it so i'm not going to give all the details away just yet today but there's a very formal process involved. Everything needs to be recorded and everything needs to be done in accordance with a plan. And it's really essential that our guardians are advised of all of these things before, not after they've been appointed, but before we even get to the appointment process. Um, you know, I think most of the time it's a parent who's going to be the person stepping up. But I also think, especially after having gone through this guide, talked to to more people, spoken with estates lawyers about what they've witnessed. We need to think about it a little bit more than just the simple, okay, mom or dad stepping up, they're the litigation guardian, they're going to be the guardian. Um, it's not going to be easy for everyone and it isn't the right role for everyone. 
makes it easier in a lot of cases to be a parent who's going to be managing things anyway, but it shouldn't just be a default. It needs to be a conversation. And I'm not sure that's always been had. Often it's the simple, who is the litigation guardian? We're going to roll them into guardianship. And so I think at the very beginning, there needs to be a conversation about what it will entail in detail. Um, the guide that we now have, my intention is moving forward to give this to our proposed guardians before we get there. So as we enter the settlement process, before the management plan is created, before the guardianship application is made, I'm going to give this to my clients to read so that they understand they're going in eyes wide open. I expect some trepidation from a lot of them because in the past, we treated settlement just as a purely happy, exciting time, which it is, mm -hmm. but it also means there's going to be some hefty responsibilities moving forward. And I think that those conversations are absolutely essential. A hundred percent. I think it was, I would have to admit it was a disservice to sort of uh, send our clients on their way once once the case was settled and say, you need a trustee lawyer and and then give them no more information about what needed to be done. Brenda, what was the experience like transitioning from litigation guardian in a, in a lawsuit to a guardian of property? So, you know, as Jan sort of touched on, it's a difficult, it's, it's a difficult transition. Um, you know, when I decided to have kids, I wasn't even sure what that entailed being a parent. Um, but, you know, you figure that out as you go along your way. And then when you find yourself in a situation where you have to be both a parent as well as um, a guardian of property uh, and be responsible for all of these pieces, they pertain to this unexpected situation in this settlement um, that needs to be managed, it's really complex because, you know, the, the decisions that I make as a parent are not necessarily the same decisions that would be made with the same type of thought process and justification that would be made as somebody who's a litigation guardian, let's say. So, you know, when I take a look at doing something with McLean and spending money or participating in something, I'm doing that you know, as a parent. And when you are doing this from the perspective of somebody who has to manage very specifically detailed and allocated funds um, that are specifically designed for a, a specific purpose, um, it's hard to reconcile both of those at the same time. And again, there was no prep for this. So there was a lot of questions coming my way about, you know, even during the initial process for this, which was, you know, how is this going to work? You know, Brenda, what do you want to do about this? You know, what do you think this amount should be? What's the frequency of this? How? I didn't know how to process that. I didn't have a magic, you know, crystal ball. I didn't know what we were going to need. You know, McLean was younger at that time. These were things I had never experienced, things that I had never been through. And so I didn't know those answers at the time. And then, you know, you move past getting all of those details put together for the sake of the management plan and 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 the structure and and moving forward. And then you have to live it in a reality. Um, so then, you know, it comes down to how is that money being spent? How is it being tracked? What is it being utilized for? Um, and it's hard. It's really difficult. It's difficult to wear a bunch of those hats and it's difficult without the experience and know how um, to just know that you're doing the right, if you're doing the right thing, are you doing the right thing? And ultimately, again, these are funds that are, have been determined um, to support McLean for the remainder of his life. And I have to be super responsible about how those are being spent. And I might think is responsible, but there may be someone else who disagrees with me on that. And that's a hard, that's a difficult piece to reconcile as being a parent and a, a, a litigation guardian, or sorry, a, a guardian of, of, um, of property and being responsible for everything that that comes with. So it's, it's, it's hard. It really is. It's difficult. And I, and, and all the help that we can give to somebody, the better. Yeah. A hundred percent. Jessica, what is the management plan and how and why is it created? So at a high level, the management plan is just a component of the application for guardianship, and it applies whether it's for a minor or an incapable person who's an adult. Um, and both the Office of the Children's Lawyer and the, the Public Guardian and Trustee have copies of their blank um, plans set out on their website, and links to these can actually be found in our settlement guide. Um, 
but the purpose of the plan is really to outline how the proposed guardian for property intends to manage the funding that's available for that, their family member. Uh, because guardians will need to closely adhere to this plan, it's important for them to work closely with the lawyers who are preparing these applications to put together a realistic plan that will meet as many of the incapable person's needs as possible. And the plan can be totally customized uh, within the parameters of what, what's available in terms of funding, of course, uh, but to ensure that the settlement funds will be used in the best interest of their family member. So proposed guardians will really need to think about their treatment needs, attendant care costs, educational expenses, accessibility devices, recreational expenses, and the list just goes on. Um, and so it's essential for parents and families to remember that the courts, the Office of the Children's Lawyer, and the public guardian and trustee are looking out for the incapable person's best interest. And so families might get some pushback or be questioned about what they put in the management plan and why certain elements have been prioritized over others. So creating a management plan can be a bit of a balancing act, um, and the decision to include certain things over others can be very difficult for family members, especially when the individual in question has significant needs um, that will span over their lifetime. And so this is why it's really important for lawyers who are creating these management plans to talk to our clients and their families uh, realistically about what will most benefit that their loved one. We really need to have open and frank discussions with them about their needs, their wants, um, and not just consider you know, what they need and what they want from a medical perspective, but we also need to consider what will help facilitate their lives, what will help integrate them into their families and their, their broader communities. And, uh, and just another thing, it's important to remember that once the management plan is set and approved, it really does need to be followed. Of course, the plan can be amended in the future um, to reflect changes in either the person's needs or the cost of services in the future. Um, but the amendment process is not the simplest. And so it's really important for families to start thinking about um, what, what the, how the funds should be used um, to best benefit the incapable person very early on in the process. Thanks, Jess. Uh, Brenda, from the perspective of a former client and guardian, what advice do you have for legal teams when creating a management plan? When, 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 when things should, what things should they ask their clients? So, uh, you know, again, having been through this and having spoken to numerous other families now over the number of years that have shared their experiences uh, with me, I, I really think that there need to be um, some detailed conversations about, you know, what, so explaining to the parents in a little more detail what this is, what this means, why this is important so that they have a better understanding of what the management plan is and what it does incorporate. Um, and, and then having a deeper conversation about, you know, what are the priorities for the family as well? What are some of the items outside of those traditional, um, let's say, interventions or traditional spends? And so if we were to look at something like even therapy, I think traditionally we probably saw management plans that include PT and OT. You know, we know now that we need to look at things like augmentative communication, speech and language pathology, feeding therapy, cortical vision impairment, like there's so many other therapies that, you know, may be incorporated. And so do we need to take a look at incorporating those in detail or making it a bucket therapy, you know, an overarching therapy um, allocation? Uh, we need to take a look at adapted equipment that may pertain to recreation. So, you know, we in the past, I think we put things in there like wheelchairs and you know, walkers and all of those are super important, but are we making allocations for things like shower caddies and commodes and adapted bikes and, you know, items like that, you know, because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that this family and this individual has what they need to be as functional and independent as possible and to meet their needs. And so even things like a hospital bed, you know, there was never a conversation about would he need a hospital bed. And the reality is, as he gets bigger and he gets larger, he's going to need a hospital bed. He's going to need a ceiling lift. He's going to need a track system. These were not conversations that we had had in great detail. Um, and these are things we're encountering now, in addition to some of these other pieces. Is travel important to that family? And, you know, I think some people may think, oh, travel is a luxury. I would argue that travel is a necessity for many individuals, and especially for those who don't have typical life experiences in other ways, that maybe these are experiential things that they would need. And so what does accessible travel look like? You know, are there costs associated with that? So I think having a deeper conversation and trying to capture as much as possible for the 
management plan, um, I think is vital so that when we hit this mark in two years from now, even the way that we look at attendant care and being really intentional about that and what that looks like and what that needs going to be, I think the more that we can be uh, thorough and try to touch all points, I do think it's going to be a more comprehensive, more complete management plan that hopefully meets the needs. And then we avoid issues down the road when we pass the accounts for things that have not been allocated, have not been accounted for. Um, so that would be my advice is just to try to have a, a really fulsome, thorough, in-depth conversation. And maybe we need to take this one step further, guys. And maybe we need to create some sort of questionnaire or something that we can utilize with our clients to make sure that we're capturing this information moving forward. So that could be a that could be a part two to this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked a lot about passing of accounts. Jan, what exactly is this and what should guardians know about this process? So I'm going to start with what I think that um, lawyers, law clerks, legal teams need to know about this, because while it's certainly referenced in the materials um, in terms of appointing a guardian and putting a management plan in place, typically the starting point is every two years and you put that in, it's part of the precedent materials we use. I will certainly disclose for my part, I don't believe I had a full understanding of what exactly was involved with passing the counts really before we undertook this entire process. Um, and so I think everyone knows that it's a generally it's, you know, compliance with management plan. That's what it is. But what does it look like? What happens? And there are some nuances here, and I would, this is where I would encourage people to take a look at our guide. We don't have time to go into all of the elements of a passing of account and nuances um, that apply to when you are a guardian of a minor versus an incompetent adult, because there are some differences. For example, with an adult, um, with the PGT, you can submit your materials with them and essentially proceed on consent if they agree. Um, it, it's not the same with kids. So basically, it's this. All of the expenses, and in some case, particularly with adults, um, where there's income coming in, have to be accounted for. Um, it's more in depth than tax, you know, doing your taxes, much, much more than that, because you're not having to account for where your money went. Um, but think of it in the same sort of way as an audit. It's going to be looking at what's happened with the money. So every single dollar, what happened with it? And how do we do this? You know, how does it actually happen? Um, in an ideal world, the guardian will have kept something like an Excel document, will have folders of every single receipt, and um, estate lawyers will tell you never, ever use cash. Try to use solely cards if you can, um, or, you know, whether it's an e-transfer, something that's easily documented so that if there are more questions and follow-up, you can get to the root of where did this money go and how can I show where it went, but record it. Absolutely everything. And imagine, imagine what that's actually like. And you see Brendan nodding away here because, you know, your kid needs some extra incontinence supplies. You run to the grocery store, you grab some extras. Here we go. Um, whatever it is, right? Like there's, there is a million little tiny expenses, which I'm guessing most guardians don't even account for because these are the things that just happen as part of day to day. But if you want to use the funds, which can be usually used for things like that, it has to be accounted for every cent. So imagine splitting up groceries, splitting up when you buy, go to the um, pharmacy for meds, like absolutely everything you can imagine has to be accounted for. There's the biggies, which are, you know, the monthly or weekly attendant care expenses that are being paid to the PSW, RSWs, whomever it is that's providing some care, uh, you know, an accessible vehicle every few years. But those are not the things that are going to be causing grief to our guardians. The things that are going to be difficult are the things that are happening on a frequent basis. You know, Brenda talked about recreation. So if you want to go on a trip and there's been some money allotted for additional expenses, well, let's let's think about how this works out. And, you know, Brenda will be able to add to this, I'm sure, because I personally haven't been through this. But if your standard ticket, you're going to bring your kid on a vacation, okay, X dollars, you have to pay for that yourself. But it's the extra overage. And now we're going to have to show what are you comparing it to? How are you saying this is for this special need? You know, did you need to get an accessible room and did it cost more? Um, did you need to 
uh, rent a, a vacation home that's completely wheelchair accessible and it costs an extra few thousand dollars to do that. What are you comparing it to? These are the kinds of things that you're going to be asked as part of this process. And that's why it's so essential that our guardians understand what will be expected of them. So recording all this, this, and if you have an Excel document and you're putting in there, you know, this extra $2,000 for the vacation home, you better add some links of all the other properties you considered, which were less money, but not accessible. So that if you're questioned, you can refer to all of these things. And this is what we're talking about. It really is an audit. And for adults, and I think it's really important to mention this too, because um, with a kid, you know, you've got their regular expenses mom and dad would normally cover. You've also got all these other things that are medical needs or extraordinary needs, but we're not really having to deal with income per se. Usually that's dealt with in the, the whole number. With an adult, it's an entirely different situation and it needs to be treated differently because every dollar that comes in through incomes, through disability, um, like LTD, STD, if they have investments, if there's one single family account, the money gets mixed, all of a sudden, all the financial decisions you previously made as a, as a couple, potentially, if a spouse is now guardian, is going to be audited. Did you want to renovate your house with the money available through the, your partner? What you would have done for sure, no problem. Nope, sorry. Now a court's going to have to look at that. So there's all of these things that are happening as part of this process that for I, I would be willing to bet the majority of guardians are big shock. And so having a guide like this to put these individuals in a position to go into it, not only with eyes, eyes wide open, because it's going to be hard. It is what it is. But so that two years down the road, they don't find out this information and all of a sudden think, I have to recreate two years yeah. of expenses. It's not going to happen, right? And- it's a problem if you can't, because if you've spent money that was not accounted for out of your own pocket, you have to repay it to the person under guardianship. This is what it means to be a fiduciary. Your rights and you know um, are not considered at all. You entirely have to be thinking of the person that's under guardianship. It, and it sounds like a scary process. And Imagine going through this without having any um, warning ahead of time of what the um, how how detailed the passing of accounts is. And so that's where I think personally, I think I did a disservice to my clients when when we sent them on their way after they've had um, resolution of their case. And then two years later, I hear from them and it's, mm. you know, and, and it's, it's never, it's never a good phone call. I mean, I'm happy to be there for them, but I, I myself felt like I needed education about the whole process myself. So it was, yeah, it's, it's very important that, that our clients are forewarned. Uh, Jessica, in what situation should an estate lawyer be engaged in the preparation of an application for guardianship and creation of a management plan? So this is actually a really interesting question, and I'm going to break it down sort of into two different parts. Um, so the first question is really whether an estate's lawyer should be involved in the application for guardianship. And the second question is at what point or when um, should the estate's lawyer be involved? And so uh, the long and short of it is really that an estate's lawyer should always have some kind of involvement in the guardianship process. They're the experts in this area. They'll be the ultimate resource for families who've taken on this responsibility. And, uh, and of course, to answer the question of when, um, the earlier on in the process, the better. But I will say the reality is that there's a bit of a balancing act here, too. It's, it's really common for the personal injury lawyer to take the lead in preparing the application for guardianship and taking on um, the creation of the management plan, just because of the cost of engaging in, uh, an estate lawyer can be um, there is a cost, of course. And so when uh, when considering whether to engage an estate's lawyer and what point, the, the biggest consideration that I take into account is the complexity of the case. And, and so I look to factors including the settlement amount in question, the needs of the incapable person that we're talking about, um, and the needs that the guardians have prioritized to help make this decision. So for example, um, we've had some cases in the office where families have had complex plans um, to use settlement funds to either build or um, renovate accessible housing. 
And so situations like this might prompt us to have early discussions with our clients. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. Um, have early discussions with our clients uh, about the recommendation to involve an estates lawyer from the outset to make sure that the management plan is drafted in a way that that ensures that it gets approved um, and minimizes the need for future amendments down the line or for future justification at um, the passing of account stage. Um, it can also be helpful to an, involve an estates lawyer uh, early on when there's a situation involving incapable adults. So this is the, the scenario that Jan was just making reference to earlier. So um, when we have an adult who suffered a serious injury later in life, unlike a child who will have discrete and separate funds coming from their lawsuit, an adult client might have assets from before the, the accident or income coming in uh, through some stream. And these assets can be jointly held with either a spouse or another family member. And so just as Jan alluded to, um, the management of, of all of the client's assets, including family assets, can become the subject of the management plan. Um, and so decisions are no longer simply just made by a spouse or another family member, for example, just like Jan said, this has to be accounted for, uh, you know, before the courts or the public guardian and trustee. And so um, an estates lawyer can be really valuable um, in the process like that, helping to um, manage complex asset situ situations or um, just providing uh, fulsome advice to those clients. Um, in situations though, where settlement funds are more limited and the needs of the, of the individual are well-established, it might be more appropriate for the personal injury lawyer to handle the application and might recommend that the clients consult with an estates lawyer on either an as-needed basis or throughout the drafting process, um, just to help them navigate through their responsibilities as a guardian. But um, ultimately the decision of whether to involve an estates lawyer and when to do so, it, it really depends on the situation and, uh, and what our clients are looking for. Thanks, Jess. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw health care costs soar, including the costs of care providers like PSWs and RNs. In these situations, guardians may not have enough funds to cover necessary care and may wish to use money allotted to recreation or other medical costs to cover an essential service like attendant care. How can a guardian best manage this difficult situation, Jan? Mm -hmm. Easy question, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> The pandemic was a, a particular example, but this could happen really at any time. But during the pandemic, right. as Janet just said, we saw costs of PSWs almost double, right? People aren't more wanting to leave their homes. Yes, you're an essential service provider, but all of a sudden, if half of the uh, PSWs aren't available, the, the prices are just going to go up and then it becomes market and then it affects everyone, you know? So even when you have someone who's been working with you for years, all of a sudden the market rates have doubled. What are you going to do? Your management plan gives you, let's say, $2,000 a month for your attendant care expenses. And you have organized your life so that every day from certain hour till certain hour, your family member has their PSW there with them while you work, sometimes outside of the home. This is essential. And you expect that there might be some variation in costs over time, but you don't expect a sudden doubling of cost or your accessible vehicle completely breaks down. Got a new one suddenly out of the blue. What are you going to do? What do you do? So there's the, what do you do in the moment? And there's the, how do you prevent this from being a really problematic situation? So in an ideal world, which, you know, most people were not living in ideal worlds, but in ideal worlds, um, there's some flexibility within the management plan. So instead of saying that there's going to be $2,000 for attendant care, there's going to be $300 for physiotherapy, there's going to be $500 for occupational, whatever, you know, like all of these different things. You might have allotted in a management plan, a certain dollar figure for the following categories of medical goods. And you list all of those things. Now, is the children's lawyer going to push back against you and say, I want to know how much everything costs? Some of them are more particular than others. And okay, we need to consider that for sure. Um, and you may have, you may not be able to do it in this way, but this is one way to consider it. There's also adding in a miscellaneous um, category add an extra $10,000, $15,000, depends on how much funds you're putting into the management plan. Obviously, that's always a consideration. If you have had a very difficult case where causation liability is very difficult 
and you get 25 cents on the dollar, you know, all the needs aren't going to be taken care of in any in any world. Um, but adding some ability to have some flexibility through, you know, multiple things covered under the same category, a miscellaneous fund that can be accessed. Okay. Those, those things are going to help our clients as they become guardians and move into this, this role. But mm -hmm. what do you do in the moment? You don't have that flexibility. So there's a couple of ways, and I'm going to caveat this big time. So if it is absolutely essential and it is remind yourselves of something, again, the fiduciary thing, it's not what's best for the family. It's not what's best for the parent or the guardian. It's what's best for the individual. So if you are going to deviate from your management plan, number one thing you need to know is be prepared if it's not, if the deviation is not approved, anything you've spent outside of limits that were allotted for, you could have to personally pay. Simple as that. I, you know what, this is like the politician lawyer answer, but it is what it is. And that is you need to know you're at risk of having to pay it as an individual. That being said, if it is something truly essential, the vehicle, for example, that you can really can justify as an essential need for the person under guardianship, there's a good chance that the court will approve that expense. Okay, there is. But it's not a guarantee. This is where it's really tricky. It's a very difficult situation to be in as a guardian, especially if you're talking about a $70,000 accessible vehicle. What an expense to potentially have to cover yourself. But that is not something to make your life easier. That is something essential. Your family member needs to access the community, access school, access whatever it might be. That's essential. Um, if it is attendant care. This is more tricky, I think, because there's an argument to be made both ways. There's the argument to say, this is absolutely essential for this um, person who needs the care to be safe at home. But what if it's a time for respite care? What if it is on a weekend when the guardian's around? It's It might be more nuanced, right? We need to think about these things in terms of what you're spending the money for. And the big bummer, truthfully, and I'd love to, you know, Brenda to nod or disagree with me, she can if she wants, is that a lot of times I think the guardians sort of take them on for the team and the guardians needs. And I actually see the question, I'm going to answer the, our attendees question because it's about guardian needs and high level guardian needs are put last really and, and mm -hmm. not considered almost at all um, in this process. It's really because again, you're a fiduciary. Your needs are not what's important here. It's the needs of the person that you are um, the guardian of. That, that's the bottom line. And so in terms of what do you do in these situations, you have to tread very carefully. You might want to consult with an estate lawyer before you do it to get their real opinion, especially if it's a huge number, like an accessible vehicle or something of that nature. You really need to do that. Um, if it's something that you're planning for, that you have some lead time, well, maybe you want to undertake the expense to amend the management plan to allow for some big needs. And so with these up, um, these updated costs for PSWs being so much higher and RSWs and RNs, um, it's probably been a time of a lot of amendment of plans because these costs are just so much more, but that's a cost as well. And again, the legal costs can probably be taken out of the money because it's not something for you personally, but again, it's not a guarantee. And these are the things that need to be considered. And if you go to a good estates lawyer and, you know, even if you can't afford a lot of time, if you can pay for one hour to ask these kinds of high level questions of an estate lawyer, you're probably going to be in a better position than hoping for the best. And, you know, every, people sort of joke around, not about this specifically, but the ask for forgiveness, not permissions, the way to go. And, you know, we've all um, joked around about this, um, but be careful because Yes, that is an option. You can you can try that. You can try it, but you might not be successful and you might right. be out of a lot of money out of your own pocket. And as long as you go into it with open eyes, truthfully, when you're dealing with an emergency situation, that, that might be what happens. That's the reality on the ground. Um, but as a lawyer, I have to be very careful to say to everyone, <laughs> you might be at risk of your own funds. Yes. Yeah, very complicated. And, and um, I mean, I agree with you 100%, Jan, like, 
you need to speak to an estate lawyer before um, undertaking these huge costs that are not necessarily in the management plan. So Brenda, uh, finally, our last question uh, for you is, what advice would you provide to a new guardian? I still have so many thoughts on what we just, what Jan just talked I about. Just, I could see your mind. You start just there. Why don't you start, why don't you start there? there? You know, well, I mean, I think, yeah, mm -hmm. I think from a, you know, I have to be careful with which hat I'm wearing, but yeah, from a legal perspective, everything you said was hundred percent bang on, you know, as someone who's a caregiver to a child who has medical complexities, you know, I would argue that if the family's not supported, the child's not supported. And I, I do think we need to take a look sometimes, even when we look at things like attendant care, um, you know, is there an opportunity built in there for respite? And so, you know, that's something that I think, you know, is very viable. It's very vital. Um, you know, if you don't have a, a parent that is fully functioning and able to, to be their very best self, that it's going to be reflected in the care of the, of the person they're caring for. There's no doubt about that in my mind. And, and that's when I talk about things like, you know, um, so, so, you know, how do you differentiate that? So yes, there's certainly going to be items that are going to directly impact that individual. So things like hospital beds, uh, wheelchairs, therapeutic interventions, medications, things that are hands-on. When you start to take a look at those recreational things, um, experiential opportunities, uh, other things like that, that's when you start to look at the family as a whole and you start to take a look at, um, you know, um, yeah, just a, a bigger piece. And even when you start to take a, things, a look at things like socialization, we don't think about that a lot, but what are the mechanisms we're putting in place to encourage you know, socialization for this individual? Are we looking at ways for them to engage with their community, with their peers, to be involved? So there's just so much more there. And, and, you know, and I've always grown up as the daughter of a retired police officer to certainly do it first and ask for forgiveness later. But when we're talking about you know, legal funds and we're talking about uh, fiduciary responsibilities, you know, I do have to be more cognizant of that. And um, so that sort of leads me into the advice that I would give for a guardian. And I think it's, it's you know, multi-pronged. I, I, I will say to a guardian, learn as much as you can, talk to as many people as you can, um, utilize the team around you, utilize the resources that are available to you, equip yourself with as much information as possible so that you can determine the best way for you to manage these pieces moving forward. I would also say, you know, try to be very confident in the decisions that you make, um, you know, keep all the information, not just the records of, of what you spent, but why you spent it, have a justification there, have a rationale and a reason for it. You know, during the pandemic, um, you know, it's a great example. And yes, we hope it doesn't happen again in our lifetimes, but it does offer an example of things that can go unexpectedly one way or the other. And so we saw situations where, you know, there was a lot of gaming systems that were purchased, um, not just for typical individuals, but also for people who had, you know, you know, neurodiversity because it was a way to stay connected. It was a way to engage. I know that, you know, our purchase of movies and things like that went up through the roof because there was just other things that were going on that we had to entertain our son with, or we had to engage him with. So, you know, you need to be intentional, not just with the purchase, but why you did it. So make a record of, I spent this amount of money doing this, but this is why. And you have to capture some of those nuances because when it comes down to a discussion about why this money was spent, you're not going to remember a year and a half from then, but why this was important. But that nuance could make the difference between you needing to you know, repay those funds when really the intention behind it was beneficial to the individual and it was actually justifiable. You just don't have the rationale there for it. So, you know, keep records of it, not just the spend, but why you did it. Understand that, um, you know, you are going to get questioned on the decisions that you make. This is not personal. And I remember the first time I went through the passing of the accounts and I said to our estate lawyer at the time, I said, you please let the children's lawyers know I will have him packed up and ready with his bags at the door. They can come and take him any time they like because I'd had enough. And, you know, it's not personal. Now, she didn't give that message to the OCL, thankfully, <laughs> but... That's how I was feeling. I thought I live with this 24 seven. In addition to everything else I have to do in my life, my kids and are my priority. McLean's well-being is my priority. I've spent 16 years making sure he has everything he's needed to be functional and independent and supported. And now I'm being questioned about my decision and it's not personal. And I needed to understand that. 
Um, so, you know, you have to just be strong in that piece. And then you also, as you said, Jan, you got to be prepared to pay things back. And the first time of the passing of the accounts, when I was hit with the potential of having to pay back $18,000 in, um, in extraordinary um, uh, costs for PSW support, because it just wasn't captured that way in the management plan, it devastated me, obviously. And we didn't have to pay it back because we had the justification. But the second time I went through the passing of the accounts, I had to take one of two, which is either we don't submit this and we eat it or we go ahead and submit it and my line of credit is ready to back it up. So, you know, you just have to make a decision about that. And like you said, Jan, there's a lot that we eat. There's a lot that we, I don't bother with going through things for because of the hassle that that might come with, but only you as a family can determine what, what you're willing to go through when you go through, you know, these passing of the accounts, because it is, a like you said, it is an audit, it is a forensic audit, but it's not just like a taxes, you know, it's taxes are like, eh, this is how you're caring for your child. And it's, you know, it, it's hard not to take it personal. So be prepared, be strong, be an advocate, you know, take advantage of the expertise around you, take advantage of the team that you have in front of you, supports, resources, and just document and explain everything because you never know when you're going to need it and download our guide because that'll help you. That's my advice yeah. for you. And take a look at the guide. And Brenda, and do you want to maybe explain how we can access the guide to anybody out there? Yeah, absolutely. So we do have it available for download on our website. Uh, there is no cost. This is a free resource for clients, uh, for people that are, you know, even if you, even if you have not gone through the whole process and you would like to take a look at what this might look like, um, just so that you have as much information as possible. So it's available for clients, for clients who have perhaps already settled and they have not gone through the passing of the accounts yet, but they want to know what's coming for lawyers who are working with clients to provide it to them as well. Um, so yes, you can access it, uh, gluckstein.com. There's an area on our website that has uh, papers and guides. So you can go there. You can, you can request a copy of the guide. Um, but in the absence of that, if you're having a hard time navigating our system, certainly just, you know, shoot us an email at info at gluckstein.com. We'd be happy to facilitate that. Uh, for you. But uh, yes, it's a free guide. And we, we hope that most people, many people can benefit from the resource we've put together. Because uh, I do truly think it addresses a gap that has been there for a while. I agree. I agree. Um, we've already answered the question that was. Well, I, no, I don't I think did. we did. Yeah, we 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 referenced it tangentially because I had yeah, seen so the, it. But um, so yeah, the question, the question is, is, what about, what about long, -term long term trauma therapy for the guardian, and is this an expense that can be accounted for? And I wanted to address it in a couple different ways. And so it depends what exactly um, the person asking the question meant. So if you mean trauma related to being a guardian is one thing. Um, if you mean long term trauma therapy, because potentially the lawsuit, the um, you know, your loved one required needing to require a guardian, there might be trauma associated with that. So it depends what that means. And I'm going to answer it from both scenarios. So if the long term trauma therapy is necessary for the guardian, because of the nature of the injury um, that the individual suffered, that would have had to be accounted for in the lawsuit through a, and a family law act claim brought. And so money would have had to be set aside for that. If we're talking about from all of the stress and additional life pressures that being a guardian can put on an individual, um, there's there's two ways to answer this question. The quick and easy one is no, there's nothing specifically for that. But the more nuanced answer is that guardians are entitled to be paid. Now, why haven't we talked about that yet? Um, there is a reason for that. And that is because most family member guardians are not paid. And why would that be? As we've just finished talking about, there's all this work. It's so much effort. Why wouldn't we put that in and allow for payment? There is a reason. Usually, 99% of the cases, there's not enough money available for the person who suffered the injury. There's not. And so when we're talking about usage of funds and how it's going to be managed, again, you know, the the... Bottom line is that that money, usually the family members say, 
And the guardian says, I, I want the money to go to the person who needs it. You know, when I'm not around, I want there to be money left so this person can have care providers, can live not in a long-term care home. They can have someone um, assisting them. There's all these reasons, right? But Brenda made an important point, which is if the family members are not in a good position, how can you be good care providers? And I, it's interesting because there's two sides of that. And one, which is, the guardian isn't necessarily a care provider in every case. A lot of times they are, but you've talked so much, Brenda, about the hats you wear and you do like you wear so many hats. And I would say you wear three distinct hats as it, as it pertains to McLean. One is his mom. Two is his guardian. And three is his care provider for his extraordinary needs. And they actually each arguably have some distinctions to them. Um, and so in terms of, you know, but well, what if the person needs the support? You know, can you be paid? You can be paid. You absolutely can. But there's one more nuance that needs to be mentioned. And that is that paid versus unpaid guardians are held to a slightly different standard. If you are paid as a guardian, as you're entitled to be, and it's annually um, 3% of the money that was um that was managed that year um, can be taken as a fee for the guardian for your, it's a time, it's a job. Um, but, but if you're paid and you do some of the business of um, ask for forgiveness, you are going to be held to the standard of a professional guardian, somebody who does this for a living. If you have something you can't justify because you didn't keep a record of it, and otherwise it's small, it's a needed item, they may not look at it as closely, your feet are gonna be held to the fire. And so you might end up losing all that payment, not to mention not to mention the additional stress and effort of the passing of account, and now the money having been taken out of the person under guardianships funds. So there are some nuances there that really need to be considered. And every case is different. So, you know, we have a, we've had clients, it's not common, where we do have a corporate guardian, they're paid, it's a huge expense, but there wasn't anyone in the family who could do it. The money had to be there. Um, you know, I, I can actually not think of any of our clients who have elected to be paid as guardians. It's just not, not the common thing to do. But there may be situations where there is, you know, a family member is it insists upon it. But then I would also make the comment to them, okay, but I need you to understand you're going to be held to a very high standard if you're paid. And it is something to consider. Um, I also wanted to, we didn't touch on this today, but one of the things and it's in our guide, but for anyone listening, um, just mentioned about having a state lawyer being ideal for every single case. There, again, financially wise, it's not always what's happening. There's lots of personal injury firms that that never use estates lawyers to do this. And we are cognizant and aware of that. Um, and it's a cost element, but it's not an all or nothing proposition. So having, you know, I mentioned before about our guardians consulting with an estate lawyer paying for an hour of their time. We can do that too. Um, as, as law firms, lawyers, just get something approved, get a consultation, ask some questions, um, advise our client guardians to get that one hour initial opinion at the beginning. So for things like one of the things um, we had a panel a few months ago on this and we involved an estate lawyer in that panel. And she said, you know, when people consult with her day one, she gives them a list of bookkeepers to use who are not, this is not an accountant. This is not, ex well, it's an expense, but it's not super expensive. And it is an expense by the way that can be paid for out of the, um, funds under management. It's not something the guardian has to pay um, privately or independently. Um, but a bookkeeper that has experience with a state's bookkeeping or guardianship bookkeeping can give you all kinds of advice, practical advice. They're not a lawyer, of course, but they're going to be really experienced and you can have someone assist you. Can they create an Excel document for you? Here's something you use. Here's a precedent. Here's how to do it. Here's how to take care of it. And so you know, um, we recognize the state lawyers are not going to be involved in most cases, but it, it's absolutely worth reaching out to one um, to get that input at minimum. You know, it's not expensive to do that, to, to prepare the documents yourself and get some advice. Okay. Those are my final ones.
So I don't know if anybody else has a question that's out there. I don't think. Um, I think, Brenda, unless you have something else to add, I think. No, I, I, you know, I mean, the, the last thing that I'll add is just, again, it's a great resource. I'm really, um, and I've said this before, uh, I'm, I'm grateful that we have put this together. I think it does address a need that is there. It addresses a gap that exists. My hope is that it can help even, you know, one lawyer as they move forward, one client as they move forward. Um, and I would just encourage people, if you're in this field, if you're in this area to make sure that you are, you know, doing your very best to provide your clients with the tools and resources, the fulsome conversations, make sure that you're not leaving them in a situation, you know, never from an ill intent, but in two years down the road where they are <laughs> very unprepared oh, no. and very upset and very sad um, because it's, you know, it's the last thing that we want to have, right? We, we've done so much work to get the client to this point where we have found a resolution for them, a positive resolution so they can move forward, hopefully um, with optimism and, you know, plan for the future. And then, you know, wham, and again, not from any ill intent, um, but I just think it's something that's just sort of sat there as a gap and, <laughs> You know, I just would encourage people to make sure that they're accessing this this resource um, so that they can make it available. I agree. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you to the panel. Thank you for everybody else out there and anybody who accesses this later. But um, check out our guide. Thank you. Bye now. Bye, everyone.